So I want to pick up uh, where we left off yesterday and uh, carry on from there, and we'll come to the doctrine of the Trinity um, uh, shortly. Uh, but we only got through three, uh, three chapters yesterday. I thought we might get through five. So I shall have to talk faster, as I said yesterday. And we'll pick up at chapter four. And we already have done some thinking about uh, Wesley's doctrine of perfecting. So perhaps I can go through uh, this chapter, chapter four, uh, fairly quickly. Uh, I reckon I've got just about ten minutes in each chapter if uh, we're going to get through this in an hour and leave time for discussion. So, uh, you understand I'm not going to be able to say everything. I mean, let's face it, you're just going to have to read the book. Uh, but at least this PowerPoint, when you get it, will give you an outline of the book, the structure of the whole book, and that's what we're, that's what we're doing here. So we come to chapter 4, and we think about Wesley's own doctrine of Christian perfecting. And I think we've first of all got to take note of the obstacles there are in understanding what Wesley said. For years, as I taught the Doctor of Holiness class, and people that seem not to understand Wesley, I began to think about why this was so difficult. And there are some obstacles in understanding what Wesley had to say. In the first place, he never really put it down systematically. His plain account of Christian perfection was a collection of writings over 40 years to prove that he had always taught this doctrine. So he doesn't actually put down systematically. That's one uh, problem. The second um, obstacle, I think, um, is that other schemes of Christian holiness are often in our minds. And so we come to Wesley with another scheme of holiness. We might have got it from the reform tradition. We might have got it from Edward. And we read Wesley and we say, he's confused. Where actually we are the ones who you. I mean, Wesley taught logic at Oxford. Uh, if anybody's confused, it's more likely to be made. And the problem often is that we don't read him deeply enough, we don't read him carefully enough. But he does have a coherent thought. But the other obstacle is, of course, that theology is always open ended. It's an infinite God we're talking about. And even we as human beings, we're not mechanisms. And particularly if you're trained in a kind of technological engineering kind of way of thinking, you want it just to be cut and dry. It's not cut and dry. Never can be. Every illustration we use drawn from the physical world is inadequate. We're talking about the mystery of God and we're talking about the mystery of human personhood. So it's always open ended. There are always more questions. And in any area of science or intellectual endeavor, the value of a good hypothesis is not that it answers all the questions, but that it answers the questions and raises new questions. And that is why in experimental science, it never comes to an end, because there are always more questions. So, I'm suggesting that Wesley's doctrine of Christian holiness is an excellent hypothesis, an excellent doctrine, because it gives us insight, but it throws up new questions so that we can go into deeper understanding. So, understanding Wesley, some of the obstacles. And then, secondly, there's a paragraph that talks about Wesley's own pilgrimage. And, of course, one of the points about this is that it's in 1725, as a young man, about to again, that he has this vision of Christian perfection. It's 13 years later before he really understands the truth of justification by faith. So, was Wesley entirely sanctified before he was justified? Now, you see, people still wrestle with that. What happened in 1725? What happened in 1738? So, you see, his own pilgrimage doesn't fit into a neat pattern. Now, we need the pattern. We need the map. And thousands of Methodists would write to them and give them their conversion story and how they grew in grace and, how, and then how they came to entire sanctification. But sometimes our experience is more messy than that. And every individual is different. But there is a value in having a map. Now we've still got to interpret the map in terms of my personal experience, in terms of the personal experience of the young people and counselling on the way. But it's not a sausage machine. 
everyone's experience is to some degree different. But this map, which Wesley eventually drew up after decades of counselling thousands of Methodists and examining his own heart, is a, a, an invaluable map in helping us to help people to understand where they are on the road and how they can come to that true hearted love of God. So, well, Wesley's own pilgrimage. Well, let me just very briefly sum up uh, his own doctrine. And first of all, justification and the new birth. Now, the point there is that for Wesley, the two things come simultaneously. And I think it's very important for us to recover the language. There's another way, by the way, recover. Recover the language of regeneration, the new birth. Now, I talked about it yesterday, so I don't mean to go on about that. <clears throat> it's not just that our sins are forgiven when we first come to Christ. It's not just forgiveness of sin. It's also the beginning of the real change. Sanctification begins at regeneration. Now, it's not getting past sanctification, but sanctification begins at regeneration. We need to get that into our heads. Sanctification begins at regeneration. Sanctification begins at regeneration. And one of the ways in which Wesley um, uh, emphasized uh, that is that it is there that our love for God as children of God, that is when we first say, Jesus Christ is Lord. That is when we are first able by the Spirit to say, Abba, Father. So the love of God begins to fill our hearts. So that's the inward aspect. But there is also, therefore, an outward aspect. And Wesley put it this way, that it is at this point of the new birth that the Christian begins to live victoriously. And Wesley said, well, he took very seriously 1 John 3, 6 and 9. The one who is born of God does not commit sin. And so Wesley said very firmly, the newborn Christian does not commit sin. He's not talking about entire sanctification. He's talking about regeneration. Wow, that's a bit tough, isn't it? Is that not overstretching a bit? The newborn Christian doesn't commit sin? Ah, said Wesley. But what does it mean in this context in first John? And this is where he softens the definition of sin. If it meant any falling short of the law of God, the Westminster uh, Catechism definition of sin, then who could say that they were born again? So said Wesley, it doesn't mean any falling short. It means deliberate, intentional, voluntary flunking of the known law of God. In other words, what he's saying is, Christians don't murder, Christians don't steal, Christians don't cheat. Now, every branch of the Christian church would agree with that. That's what he's saying. He's talking about voluntary, intentional, deliberate flouting of the known, written law of God. Christians don't go around flouting. That's what he's saying at this point. But, there are still involuntary transgressions. Now, sometimes we use the word mistakes. That's a bit of a weak word. It can sound a bit as if we're excusing ourselves. No, 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 no. These are involuntary transgressions. And Wesley says they need the blood of the atonement and they need to be confessed. So we don't go around flouting the outward law of God, murdering, stealing, cheating. But we do have to confess daily how far we fall short. You know, I think that's something we have not sufficiently ended. And the danger of that is spiritual pride. We have to make confession, we have to recapture confession as part of our spiritual discipline as individuals and as a fellowship of the people of God. Confession has to have its place in our worship. Not that we are saying that Christians live a sinning religion. No. We do not flout the outward laws of God, the written laws of God. But we have to confess that we have not reached that absolute perfection that is only for the hereafter. So it's at that point, in relation to regeneration, that Wesley's famous definition of an act of sin, a voluntary expression, 
when an old law comes into play. But that, of course, leads to the gradual work of salvation. That's where it's actual phrase, the gradual work. And sadly, sometimes in our tradition that has been denied. But you cannot understand entire sanctification unless you understand gradual sanctification. The two go together. They imply each other. And it is only once we have set out on the road to follow Christ that we can understand from the inside what that means. It is only once we have set out to follow Christ that we understand what the temptations are, what the tensions are, what the things are that try to, try to divert us from the path. You cannot understand that unless you set out to follow Christ. And then it is you become aware of how the seeking is in red sin. Only then do you become aware that there is this tension, that this tension rather, between this new commitment to follow Christ and the old lifestyle, which may be moral, which may have many good features about it, but which is essentially self centered, self seeking, self propagating, self sovereignty. And therefore, it is only through the moral experience of day to day living that we come to understand the need to be delivered from this inherent, inbred sin. And therefore, it is only through that gradual work of sanctification that we are brought to the point of entire sanctification and we cry out to God to deliver me from this. And so to fill my heart with his love. But that old self-centered style of living is fulfilling Nullify and by the grace of God from that day forward. As I live in the light and daily consecrate myself to God, can the love of God filling my heart cancel, nullify, obliterate the old self centered lifestyle. As we live in light. Well, that point of entire sanctification is only the gateway, as we said yesterday. Not something to be sought for its own sake, but the gateway into the light of perfect life. Because if I truly love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, I will love my neighbor. I will love his creatures. I will love those who are around me. Not in my own strength, but through the infilling of the Holy Spirit of Jesus, who loves us with an inexhaustible love. So that it's not just loving our neighbor of ourselves, but the infinitely deeper great command of loving each other as Christ loves us. However, that is still an imperfect perfection. And it's an imperfect perfection still for two reasons. First of all, the involuntary transgressions. Wesley says there is no one who has reached that height of holiness where they still do not have to confess how far they fall from. And those who are furthest ahead in the road, he says, are those who are most aware of how far they have to go. In other words, to boast in one's holiness is an intolerable hypocrisy. You've heard of the uh, spoof title uh, of the book Humility and How I Achieved It. Just as that is a holiness and how I achieved it. And we have to be so sensitive to the dangers of spiritual pride. And the person who is closest to God is the person who feels himself furthest from God. And he is so aware of how much further she and he has to go. Well, uh, that's Wesley. The, the voluntary transgressions on the last point. Yes, an imperfect perfection because of the fallen body. Wesley says, even those who love God with all their heart, mind, soul, soul or strength can't always do what they ought to do or what they want to do because of the bodily organs. 
And particularly, he says, I, I love this uh, phrase, um, particularly um, the brain. Uh, the fallen brain. And even when we love with all our hearts, we don't understand, we don't see the situation. And so we may offend you. Um, because uh, it's not the problem we don't love them, it's the problem we don't understand what's going on. And so because our brains are still fallen, um, we're not able to perform that. So there is no perfection of performance. Only a perfection of intention, and that is only by the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, uh, that's Wesley's doctrine, but of course uh, I have been um, interpreting it a bit there, and uh, um, in chapter 5 I take that further into the question of how we reformulate Wesley's doctrine for today. So here we move on to chapter 5, because we're not just interested in uh, antiquarian study of an 18th century English Oxford dog. What is of concern to us is to be able to communicate and understand the life of Holiness for 21st century people. And not only in our own culture in the West, but in cultures around the world. So how do we express this in today's language? Because Wesley had his limitations, you see. He is a man of his time. And one of the points about that is, that deeply affects us, is that when Wesley died in 1791, the social sciences had hardly got going. That great Scotsman Adam Smith, of course, had launched the science of political economy, so econo e economics were on the way. But sociology, psychology, they all came in the 19th century after he died. And so we have all kinds of ways of thinking under the influence of Adam Smith and Sigmund Freud and Karl Marx and Max Weber. And that whole development comes post likely. And so he doesn't have those conceptual tools. And so we have to rethink, re-express uh, what he wanted to say. One particular example here. It's really only with modern psychology that we have begun to understand the reality of the unconscious mind. We sometimes call it the self-conscious mind. That has become part of our culture. Even though we've never studied psychology, we understand that there is such an issue. That was completely foreign to the thinking of the eighteenth century. No concept of it. So one of the ways in which we have to bring Wesley's doctrine, which we believe to be a good interpretation of scripture and in line with the fathers and the medievals, one way we have to bring it into the twenty first century is by wrestling with this area of conscious motivation and unconscious motivation. So there's one way in which Wesley um, is uh, a man of his time. Um, and the other way in which he's a man of his time is that he didn't think through the coherence of his doctrine of sanctification fully with the doctrine of the atonement, the doctrine of Christ, or with the doctrine of the Trinity. Now he's not to blame for that. Nobody in the 18th century thought in that kind of way. It's only with the 19th century that theologians begin to think doctrines into each other instead of keeping them in little watertight compartments. Schleiermacher as the great father of liberal theology, although his particular way of doing it, I would reject. Nonetheless, the fact that he taught us to integrate our theological thinking in that kind of way. Wesley lived before that time. And the 18th century was not a great age for theology. Great philosophers, yes. No great theology, really, in the 18th century, as it came later. So we can't blame Wesley for that. But the task does fall to us. How does this doctrine of sanctification fit in? How is it coherent? with the central affirmations of the Christian faith that Jesus Christ is Lord and that we are baptized into the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How does sanctification fit into that? And so, this is uh, a task we must tackle. Well, we'll come on to that uh, uh, from chapter 6 onward. Uh, but let me, first of all, think about how we might uh, express the, length, the, the uh, doctrine of sanctification in 20th century, 21st century terminology. I think I'm maybe for a 20th century man, but uh, um, we have to, uh, and of course, we're still largely shaped by the thinking. Well, there are two key concepts uh, that uh, I want to suggest, and uh, the second one is familiar to you, I'm sure. The first one may not be so familiar, but I think it's absolutely key. It is the language of motivation. 
Now, that's not language that you find. You don't find that word, motivation, in the Bible. You don't find it in the fathers, or the medievals, or in the reformers, or in Wesley. What you do find is the language of intention, intentionality. And that, I think, you can take as a similar thing. But to translate that into the way we think and speak today, I think the word motivation is vitally important. And one of the important points I think here is that uh, psychology in several of its schools has taught us to think of two levels of motivation. We've talked about, I mentioned Freud, in a way psychoanalysis will differentiate between conscious motivation and the unconscious, shaped by childhood experiences, by nature and by that and so on. Not only psychoanalysis, but um, experimental psychology, which regards itself as more scientific than psychoanalysis, will also differentiate between the unconscious level of motivation, the visceral organs, the autonomic nervous system, affecting the brain, so that our uh, motivation is based in, but not producible to, our physiology. Now, people like D.F. Skinner want to say, you can reduce motivation all to the chemistry. It's all physiological. Well, we reject that materialism. But it is true that our motivation is based in the visceral organs and nervous system. But then it's what we do with that. There is also the level of conscious intentional motivation. If that is not true, then we can dispense with ethics. There's no such thing as ethics. So we need both levels. Now the fascinating thing about that that I find is that you can see both of these levels in biblical anthropology. Old Testament anthropology is very strong on the psychosomatic unity, the soul-body unity of a person. So that, for Old Testament uh, anthropology, our motivation is based in the physical organ. The liver, the blood, the bowels. If you're old enough to remember the King James Version, you remember that lovely phrase, bowels of mercy, which sadly the modern translators have cut out. But that is the very down-to-earth earthiness of Hebrew thinking. The flesh, our motivation is based on the fact that we are physical beings. But the Old Testament also talks about the heart. As one thinks in the heart, so he of the way. And the New Testament adds new terms, the mind, the conscience. The Old Testament would use the word heart to refer to it all. That is the level of conscious, intentional motivation or intentionality. Now, I think it is very useful for us to say, when we talk about loving God with our heart, that's the level of intentionality, of conscious intentionality we're talking about. But as long as we live, we remain in the old college flesh. We are not yet in the resurrection body. We are still in the flesh, the body which is affected by the fall. But, by the grace of God, we do not have to live according to the flesh. That's the difference. We can live by the grace of God, with hearts filled with the love of God, so that while we are still fallen creatures, nevertheless, we can love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, there is one language, motivation, intentionality. And we have to understand that with young people, everyone who goes to college, now getting a dose of psychology, we have to relate our thoughts to that conceptuality, that way of thinking, if we are going to communicate what we mean, and perhaps more importantly, what we don't mean. The second uh, concept is one you will be familiar with, because um, many or several uh, uh, Nazarene theologians, Wesleyan theologians, have used the concept of relationship. Now again, this is a term not found in the Bible, not found generally uh, in the Fathers, with reference to this. No, it does begin to appear in the Greek Fathers, yes. Yeah. Um, and it's certainly on Augustine, but uh, uh, relationship is a very recognisable word in contemporary language. 
if you're talking about relationships. Of course, the biblical term that is at the basis of it is the term love. But actually, relationship is a very helpful term because what it makes clear is that love is not just a, an emotion. Love is not just something subjective and eternal. There is always an objective pull to love. So the word relationship helps us to talk about that. We're not just talking about emotional trips. We are talking about changes in us that come about as a consequence of relationship. So, there too is a very uh, useful concept and uh, other theologians, I'm sure you know, uh, have developed that line. A third uh, concept, which I don't actually develop in the book, but which would be very usefully developed, is the whole concept of development. What can we learn from developmental psychology that would help us to express the truth of Christian science? So I just throw that in uh, as something I thought about in class, but which I didn't uh, write up. So those are two key concepts. So what we're actually talking about when we talk about sanctification is a revolution in our motivation as a consequence of a new relationship. A revolution in our motivation as a consequence of a new relationship. And I bring it in in that section the well-known uh, book title uh, by Sean uh, Kierkegaard, Purity of Heart is to Will One but that motivation, that revolutionary motivation, is a, a result of this new relationship. Now, at the end of that chapter, um, I do go on to look a little more closely, therefore, at this whole difficult, complex area of the doctrine of original sin. Now, uh, this is not something that Augustine made up. This is biblically based. This is in the Greek Fathers. Augustine did develop it in certain particular ways. And one particular idea of his, that original sin is passed on through lust, is something we can reject as totally unbiblical and totally misleading. However, where Augustine is very profound is where he talks about sin as essentially self-centered desire, concupiscentia. And in that section, I try to develop that a little more for the self-centeredness, which may take the form of pride, but which actually may take another form. It may take the form of sloth. And uh, I use there the work of a young theologian, um, uh, Matt Jensen, in his book, uh, uh, on, on original sin and tracing this development down through the centuries, uh, in which he draws on this idea from Karl Barth that this self-centeredness of ours is not always a matter of self-assertion. It can also be a matter of self-withdrawal. Don't disturb me. Don't challenge me to launch out for God. I will sink into my own little private world and will not launch out the fight. Slot. And that can even take forms of sicknesses of the soul, such as self immigration Now, feminist theologians have felt to see that. It's not just a matter of macho self assertion Sin can also take other forms of self denigration And our own Muslim theologian, uh, Dr. Leanne Declare, has reminded us of that. There, there, it's not all the pride and self assertion it can be self centered But whatever it is, it is a kind of self centeredness Late uh, Dr. Richard Howard of this university marvelously developed this idea as uh, based in Paul's thought, self-sovereignty, self-centeredness, and being the way in which we are to understand this appalling reality of original sin. The other aspect of the doctrine of original sin that I think that we have to talk about more is its corporate aspect. Now, whereas Augustine is very insightful in the individual psychology, what we have to grasp is that we are fallen corporately. That is the implication of the uh, Old Testament biblical concept of the flesh. The flesh is humanity as a corporate entity. Corporately, we are restrained from God. Now, we are Westerners. We think very individualistically. We somehow have to get back to this biblical understanding that we begin with the corporate. 
And uh, for my uh, way of thinking, that is why uh, we have to understand the atonement, not so much as universal atonement, but as corporate atonement. I think that's a better phrase for the same word. It's not that everyone universally is saved, it's not universalism, but it is that in the cross of Christ, our corporate fallen of flesh is dealt with, and therefore all become the knowledge of the truth. Well, uh, there's so much more in that, and uh, the doctrine of original sin is something we need to continue to wrestle with. But that's chapter 5, um, uh, and uh, that uh, reference there is to Matt Jensen's book. Um, which uh, I find very helpful in developing that. Well, time is getting away from us, but um, let me move on then to what is really uh, the second half of the book. Because so far, what we have been trying to do is to understand the doctrine, to see its biblical basis, to see its development through the centuries, the fathers, the medievals, right up to Wesley himself. Now this morning, we've looked very briefly at Wesley himself, we've looked at expressing the doctrine in contemporary terms, but now I come to the big question. What is the basis for this understanding of Christian perspective in the central doctrines of the Christian faith? The atonement is chapter 6, the incarnation, the person of Christ is chapter 7, Chapter 8 focuses on the Holy Spirit, and chapter 9 tries to bring it all together. But the point I tried to make at the beginning of this chapter, uh, the next chapter, chapter 6, is that actually all of this is a way of talking about the Trinity. Because, you see, where we begin with the doctrine of the Trinity, it's not up in heaven with what has been eternally true. Where we begin with the doctrine of the Trinity is down on earth. We begin with Jesus. It is because in Jesus we see the grace of God. It is because he is God incarnate. It is because he died for our sins that we are reconciled to the Father by the Spirit. So actually from here on, I'm talking about what theologians call the economic trinity. The trinity as active in the economy, the dispensation of salvation. So right away in chapter 6, uh, where we talk about Christian holiness and the atonement, we are beginning to talk about God active in the world for salvation, the economic trinity. Well, this chapter focuses on the doctrine of the atonement, and right away I want to dismiss this language of theories of the atonement. That was language invented in the 19th century. It is most misleading. It gives the idea that there are three or four or six or ten theories of the atonement and you've got to choose one and forget the other. Well, that's absolute nonsense. That's no way in which to approach the doctrine of the atonement. And what we have to understand is that there is no theory of the atonement. There is no explanation that can tie all these things together. This is a mystery beyond our ability to plumb. But what we do have are models what is a model? A model is a metaphor that has become definitive. And in every area of, Christ, of, of thinking, in science, in uh, the social sciences, we use models, we use metaphors. And the Bible is absolutely full of metaphors. Jesus spoke in parables, figures of speech. And when we're talking about God, we have to understand that our human language is really inadequate. And so what the Bible gives us is a whole series of metaphors. Now, we do have to make it clear that metaphors are referring to what really happened, what really is true. Metaphors are not fiction. Because Jesus used parables to talk about the kingdom of God, and because we are not to take those literally, so the kingdom of God is not literally a mustard seed. But the kingdom of God is secretly growing. So there is always a literal truth behind the metaphor. But very often it's not possible to express it in other words other than metaphorical language. So what we have for the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, uh, what we have, I beg your pardon, for the doctrine of the atonement, 
what we are given in Scripture is not theory, but a narrative. Christ died for our sins. And a series of methods by which we may understand God. Now, of course, in this chapter, we're not just concerned with looking at the doctrine of uh, the atonement. What we are concerned to do is to ask this question. What is the basis for our understanding of Christian perfection in the doctrine of the atonement? In other words, what happened that day on the cross of Calvary that makes it possible for you and I to love God with all our heart, soul, and strength? Now, we know there is some connection. We have talked about the cleansing blood of Christ. But what exactly does that mean? It obviously doesn't mean literally the physical blood of Christ because that no longer exists in the physical world 20 centuries later. It is somehow metaphorical that we are claimed by the of Christ. But what does it actually mean? What is the basis for cleansing in the death of Christ? How are these two things connected? And I don't think we have wrestled with that sufficiently. But that's the question we want to look at here. What was it that happened that day that makes it possible for you and me to know the cleansing and the infilling of the Holy Spirit? Well, the Doctrine of the Atonement is a, a large area and we're trying to put it into one chapter here. But what I do is I take three of the offices of Christ that they were called. Christ was anointed as our Messiah. In the Old Testament, prophets, priests and kings were anointed. And so it has been part of the tradition of Christian theology to talk about the atonement as carried out by Christ as our king, as our priest and as our prophet. So first of all, he is our victorious king. He is the one who is victorious over the forces of evil. Now that is uh, an angle on the atonement that was particularly brought out in the early 20th century by a Lutheran theologian, Gustav Lane, and our own Dr. William Greathouse picked that up in an article in the Western Theological Journal in 1974, later republished, uh, in which he said, here is a basis in the atonement for our understanding. So, that is number one. But let me go to number two, since time is second. What about the priesthood of Christ? Well, what is unique here, what is different about this priesthood, different from all the priesthoods of the Old Testament, is that this priest does not offer the body of the mother, a bull, a goat, a lamb. He offers his own body. The priest is the victim. It is his self offering. Uh, well, traditionally, in uh, Western thought, the theologian who has had the most influence on us here is Anselm. And Anselm, from his famous book, Cur Deus Homo, Why God Became Man, published in the 11th century, linked this with the whole business of satisfying the law. Not so much satisfying the law, but satisfying the law of God. So, we have sinned. We have not given God the honour due to him. Therefore, either satisfaction must be given, or we must be punished. And some said, Christ came to give God all the honour due to him in his death. Therefore, no one will be punished. Now, later on, the reformers, standing in the Anselmic tradition, developed that into an understanding of penal substitution, that Christ did not only offer satisfaction, so no one would be punished, but Christ actually bore our punishment. That is the doctrine of the reformers, the doctrine to which Wesley himself uh, ascribed. But you see what this is doing? It is linking the cross to justification. And the whole Christian tradition of the West has tended to link the cross to justification, the forgiveness of our sins. But the question we want to ask is, how is the cross linked to our sanctification? And that as a whole has been neglected by the whole Western tradition. What happened at the cross to make possible not only the forgiveness of our sins, but our sanctification? 
You see, we have fallen into that too. We have tended to link Jesus and the cross with justification and the first blessing. The Holy Spirit and Pentecost and sanctification and the second blessing. But you see, what is the relationship of Christ and the cross to our sanctification? That's the question we are trying to penetrate here. Well, it's at this point that we have to understand that there is more to Christ's work on the cross than the propitiation of God's wrath or the satisfying of the law. There is the other side of that, which is the fact that Christ is not just our lawyer, not just our advocate, he is a priest. So this is in the context of worship. This doesn't take place in a law court. Sacrifices take place in a temple. So what was there about this real sacrifice which brought about the dealing not just with the guilt, but with the actual sinfulness? How did the atonement of Christ deal with our original sin, our condition of sin? Well, the aspect of the Old Testament model of sacrifice that helps us here is that the death of Christ not only brought about initiation, satisfying the law, dealing with our guilt, the sacrifice of Christ was also an expiation, a wiping out, an obliterating, a crucifying of the old sinful man. Somehow, in the body of Jesus, the old sinful humanity died. And so out from his tomb came the new humanity, the resurrection humanity of the living God. So, I uh, argue in that chapter there that the idea of cleansing from sin, the idea of death to the old man, the old humanity, is rooted in expiation, the wiping out of the sinful body. But then thirdly, there is the aspect of the unique prophet. Christ is not only our king, he is not only our priest, he is also our prophet. And therefore, there is a third dimension of the atonement that we have to look at. So not only does he provide for sanctification by being our victorious king over the power of evil, not only does he provide for our sanctification as a self-sacrificing priest in whom the old humanity dies and is raised again, but also he is the unique prophet. Now here, the view of the atonement that seems to link up with this is what has generally been known as the moral influence or exemplaricity of the atonement. Now, I go into why that does not work on its own as an understanding of the atonement. But what is true is that if in the cross of Christ our King was victorious over the Christ of if in the cross of Christ our priest put to death the old humanity, then the cross of Christ does reveal, as nothing else can be, the love of God. Without the kingship and the priesthood, it does not reveal the love of God. This is the death of a good man hung up naked in agony before the world. How can that demonstrate the love of God? The cross does not demonstrate the love of God in itself unless it was the victory of our king over the of Jesus. Unless it was the sacrifice, it was the death of the old man, the crucifixion of the old man, so that we too can be crucified with Christ. If those are true, then the cross is the unparalleled revelation of the love of God. That he loved us so much that he went to such depths to bring us to share in his life. When I survey the wonders of the cross, which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count the cross and forth and tent from all my fight. And what is the outcome? My consecration. For the whole realm of nature, mine that were nothing far too small, love so amazing, so divine, man is my life and soul. So my consecration comes out of this vision of the love of Christ, displayed, black-hearted before us, 
of the prophet. Well, that's chapter 6, and um, very quickly summarised, there is much more in there, I think, for you uh, to meditate and to think about. Um, so, um, let me try and uh, just very quickly indicate what are in the remaining chapters in uh, about five or ten minutes or so. Obviously, I'm not going to have to start to be able to go through these things uh, as that. But if you have to do that, is. So, seven, Christian holiness and the incarnation. Here I talk a bit about the centrality of Christ and a debate that has taken place. Is the cross or the incarnation central? Is the central doc- is the central text Christ died for our sins, or is the central text the word became flesh? Well, I briefly answer four. So here we come to Christology and sanctification. So we're not just looking at the doctrine of Christ its own sake. We are saying what is the basis in the doctrine of the person of Christ for our sanctification. And of course, Paul's great text here in First Corinthians, uh, Christ Jesus, whom God made unto us wisdom, sanctification. Christ Jesus is our sanctification. How so? Well, here I explore this under three headings. First of all, that Christ sanctified our humanity by assuming it. That in his conception and birth, he took humanity, our common corporate human flesh, from his mother Mary, who, contrary to Roman Catholic doctrine of very recent century, and in line with what the fathers had to say, was a sinful member of Adam's sinful race. Is he there for sinful? No way. Why? Because in the very action of conception and birth by action of the Holy Spirit, the human nature of Jesus Christ is sanctified in such a way that he is a sinless human being. That is the root of our sanctification. It is our humanity that he took affected by sin. It is our humanity that he sanctified not just by what he did but by who he became. Not just by his work but in his person he represents sanctified humanity. So Christ sanctified our humanity by assuming it. And there I explore the statement of the fathers, which they all say in one form or another, that the unassumed is the unredeemed. He takes everything in such a way that in him it is fully and fully sanctified. But that's our corporate humanity. We are not just one big corporate love. We are also individual persons. And so we've got to go on to say that Christ sanctified our humanity by living in it. That as a human being, he made moral choices at every stage of his life from the great theologian of the second century, Irenaeus, developed this, how as an infant and a child and an adolescent and an adult, Jesus faced moral temptation. And at every time, he was And so he doesn't only sanctify our common flesh, he sanctifies personal living by the way he lived out his life of obedience to the God at every step of the way. And of course it was that that took him all unto death even death on the cross and so thirdly we have to come back to the point that Christ sanctified our humanity by crucifying it and somehow a mystery too deep for us to plot but somehow the death of Christ is the death of the old Macedonic humanity fascinating text in Romans 6 we talk about dying to sin Paul in Romans 6 actually says, Christ died for sin. What on earth does that mean? Does it mean that he was a sinner? No way. I would understand that as meaning that at every step of the way, as he was victorious over real temptation, the human being, Jesus, died for sin. At every point, 
towards the way of the Father. But he carried through that self-denial all the way to the ultimate possible self-denial. Giving his life on the cross. There, Jesus finally and definitively died to self And that is why it has become possible for you and me, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to be crucified with Christ and to live with him in the life of righteousness and holiness. So, chapter 7 talks about Christian holiness and the incarnation. Well, chapter 8 then moves on to talk about Christian holiness and the Holy Trinity, but more specifically now focusing on the Holy Spirit. And here we cross over this line. We have looked in chapter 6 and chapter 7 at what Christ did for us in his birth, life, and death of the cross. But what we now must go on to consider is what he does in us. Because now that he has provided that salvation, we have to enter in. Now that we have been reconciled, we have to respond to the challenge, be reconciled. And that can only be so as Christ works in us by his Spirit. And so this chapter develops the doctrine of the Spirit and the last days. The doctrine of the Spirit is an eschatological doctrine. The doctrine of the Spirit is the doctrine of the age to come. And so, in Peter's proclamation in Acts 2, you have this already, not yet. So, not yet are we in the resurrection body. Not yet has the kingdom come in glory and power. But already, Christ has come. The world has become flesh. Already, he has died for our sins. Already, he has risen to the right hand of the Father. And already, he is all out of the Holy Spirit. That is Peter's message on the day of Pentecost. Now, to understand that, we have to talk about the Spirit active in the life of Christ. And so, in this next section, I talk about how the Spirit is active at his birth, at his baptism, in his ministry, in his death, and in his resurrection. So, how did the human being Jesus live the holy life? By the time of the Holy Spirit. At his baptism, he receives the Spirit from the Father in order that he might minister all the way to the throne. When he ascends to the Father, he pours out on the gathered apostles that same Holy Spirit by which he lived the life of holiness. And therefore, the holy life of Jesus may be reproduced in the apostles and so in us. So the Holy Spirit and the apostles, therefore, they are born into the old age, but they meet Jesus, and then at Pentecost, they receive the Holy Spirit, each in them, in such a way that they might live the holy life as he did. And that is true today. The Spirit and the disciple today, there's a not yet. We're still in the fallen body. There is still the reality of falling short, these involuntary transgressions, which we have to confess. But there is already the Comforter has come. The Spirit of Jesus has come in such a way that we can be sanctified through and through and love God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. We may too share in his victory over temptation. We may share in the pure heart of Jesus. So, chapter 8 is developing there um, this aspect of um, the economic community, the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And there we see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at work uh, within us. Well, that brings us, that was chapter 8, that brings us to the last chapter, which I just want to mention uh, very briefly, where we move from the economic community, God active, the Son, the Spirit, fulfilling the will of the Father in the economy of salvation. We move from that to the imminent Trinity, the eternal Trinity, God as Trinity in Himself. And uh, there are several sections in this chapter I deal with the fact that the doctrine of the Trinity has come vibrantly alive in the last 70 years. Up until then, you believed it if you were orthodox, but you really didn't think that had any relevance for our living. Or you dismissed it as a liberal as a conundrum that you could forget about. What does the doctrine of Trinity have to do with our living? Well, 
I think we've already begun to see, I hope, that the economic community is vitally connected to our um, living. So, we've moved from an age when the Trinity was neglected into a great number of books and theologians and discussion going on about the doctrine of the Trinity and how it should shape our life as the Church. The Wesleyan tradition does have a strong understanding of the Trinity. Charles Wesley published a book of um, hymns of the Trinity. Uh, but later, through the 19th century, as liberal theology began to affect the Wesleyan tradition, uh, that became somewhat neglected. Well, coming to the position today, I want to suggest that there are actually two models here of the Trinity which can affect the way we think about holiness. And one is what I want to call the monotheistic model, where we really think it's much more important to say that God is one than to say that God is three. So our focus is on the oneness of God. And, very often, in our writing about this, we've begun with the holiness of God. Good. We sang this morning about the holiness of God. Holy, holy, holy. So we've begun with the holiness of God sometimes, or often, in our writing about our own Christian holiness. Yes, God is holy before we are. But we have tended to do this in a very individualistic way. We have tended to focus on the one God being holy. And therefore we have taken the original meaning of the Hebrew word as separation, as you said. That's what holiness is. It's separation. But there is a problem about that. If holiness means only separation, and if God was eternally holy, how could that be when there is no sin to be separate from? There must be more to holiness than separation. There must be a positive, not just a negative. But because we have thought of the monotheistic model of the holy God, you know, the mysterium, tremendum, met personans, we thought about the holy God, we have tended to think of holiness simply as, merely as, separation. And that has been extremely individualistic and uh, we have thought about the imago, the image of God, as being in my individual soul. But what much contemporary thinking is emphasizing is the Trinitarian model. How was God eternally holy? Because within the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the Father loved the Son, and the Son loved the Father each other. Holiness of love can only be understood ultimately in terms of the doctrine of the Trinity. It is because God is a fellowship of holy love that the pouring out of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost produces this fellowship of love, the Church. And therefore we are to think of the image of God not just as individuals, but the Church as the image of God. So that within the church, the interpersonal relationships of perfect love in the power of the Spirit are a reflection of the eternal relationship of the Father for the Son and the Son for the Father in the unity of God. And that love is of such a kind that it is not kept within that circle. It is exclusive, but it is also included in the sense that the love of God was such that it was not sufficient to be contained within the mutual love of the Holy Trinity, but it all out the creation of a world and the creation of creatures who were to be in the image of God. And so the love of God pours out upon us. And therefore, as the Church images the Holy Trinity, the love of the Holy Trinity, it is not just a circle in which we love each other, but it is imaging God in that the love of God pours out in mission to a lost and dying. Holiness, therefore, understood as love, necessarily deserves in mission. But the day is coming when the mission will come to an end. 
And when all who have responded to the love of God are drawn into that eternal worship. So the ultimate raison d'etre, the ultimate goal and aim of the church is that through mission we may in worship bring the whole creation to worship our loving God. There is the goal. So, rather than an individualistic understanding, there we have a corporate, interpersonal understanding of holiness as the profound love of God. Charles Wesley has a great hymn, Father of everlasting grace, thy goodness and thy truth we praise, thy goodness and thy truth we prove. Thou hast in honour of thy Son the gift unspeakable sent down, the Spirit of life and power and love. Send us the Spirit of God to make the depths of Godhead known, to make us share the life divine. Send Him the sprinkled blood to apply. Send Him our souls to sanctify and show and feel us ever thine. So shall we pray. Never cease. So shall we thankfully confess thy wisdom, truth, and power and love with joy and Speakable adore and bless and praise thee evermore in sight of the fathers to God. Till, added to that heavenly choir, we raise our songs of triumph higher and praise thee in a bolder strain. And I love this next line. Out soar the firstborn seraph light and sing with all our friends in light thy everlasting life. Very Charles Wesley, in the most marvelous Trinitarian thing, which brings our Christian experience into an experience of the Holy Spirit and lifts us up to praise Him and the door of Him as the Holy forever. Well, Charles Wesley teaches us that theology is to be sung, and we've done some good singing uh, today.